Protecting planet Earth is critical to the future of everything. But if you focus on the campaigning mantra of the Green Movement, you'd be forgiven for thinking that for environmentalists, the key to that future is clinging to the past. Stop HS2, ban fracking, no third runways, ban plastic straws, neonicotinoids and Chinese lanterns, stand with Extinction Rebellion and bring London life to a halt. At first glance, the Green Movement can give the impression it's all about stopping things from happening and returning to a simpler way of life. We call for curbs on international trade in commodities like soya, cocoa, beef and leather that drive deforestation, and we call instead for localism and fewer food miles. We oppose fast fashion and consumerism and ask people to remember how to reuse, repair and recycle. We draw lines on maps that become protected areas and we designate features within them to preserve. Even the name conservationist speaks of a movement that's all about yesterday. Stop, stop, stop. And there's no doubt about it. We have to look after our planet better for the future of our society. And that means halting and reversing some of the biggest trends associated with modernity. We can't go on living the way we have if we want to go on living. For decades, our demands on the earth have exceeded our world's ability to sustain itself. We already use the equivalent of 1.7 Earth's worth of natural resources, and our use of materials is expected to double by 2050. So the most urgent priority for the future of our planet is putting in place the legal frameworks we need to halt and reverse that train of destruction. <laughs> and this was meant to be a big year for stopping things. Super 2020. The year the nations of the world come together to strike three new environmental agreements to secure the future of our planet. First of all, in Lisbon, Portugal, a global oceans treaty to protect the high seas. Believe it or not, there's no international agreement for protecting our ocean in the area beyond national jurisdiction. That's 95% of our ocean completely unprotected. Talks are intended to agree a new legal instrument to protect areas of the ocean from human activities for the first time. And then in Kunming, China, there was meant to be a new agreement under the Convention on Biological Diversity to halt and reverse the relentless decline of wildlife that's really been going for a century now. These talks are intended to strike a new, more accountable and action-focused target to halt species decline in the next 10 years and protect 30% of our land and sea for nature all across the globe. And in Glasgow, Scotland, we were meant to agree new climate change targets to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Each of these areas is essential for human prosperity in its own right, and crucially, they're also completely interdependent. We'll never solve climate change if we continue to trawl up the blue carbon locked in our seabed or burn our forests and peatlands. We'll never bring life back to our terrestrial, fresh water and marine ecosystems unless we curb CO2 emissions and halt climate change. So this was meant to be the year when new deals were reached to stop over-exploitation of our ocean, to stop the destruction of habitats and species, to stop emissions of greenhouse gases from causing runaway climate change. So far then, not much to break the caricature of us environmentalists with our hair shirts and stop signs. But take a closer look and you find that the political, social and scientific efforts needed to put the brakes on environmental catastrophe is a rocket boost for progress. The first and most obvious way is that technology can be a cure as well as a cause of environmental harm. Tackling those environmental risks has been a powerful driver of innovation that will bring far wider benefits. In response to climate change policy, trillions of pounds of investment have poured into clean energy innovation. Renewable energy continues to become cheaper and more readily available at every scale. And this environmental innovation could have amazing social benefits for the billion people across the globe without access to electricity. Countries in the most energy hungry places on earth like Sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean 
could make the most of wind and solar to create a much more accessible and egalitarian energy system that breaks people's reliance on the government and on a centralised grid. We're living through a green industrial revolution. But more exciting than technological change is the social and political innovation being born out of environmental need. Environmental thinking is reshaping political economics to forge ever more complex, closer international deals that delve deeper into national sovereignty and deeper into individual life than ever before. And to get that right, the international political system needs to change. To puncture the political assumptions that have developed over centuries and have become ingrained in the idea of the post-war nation-state with almost exclusive say and sovereignty over what happens within its borders. It's a simple but central insight of environmental politics that the natural world knows no borders, so nor must environmental action. A tonne of carbon is a tonne of carbon wherever on earth it's emitted. Air and water pollution don't respect national boundaries, and birds know no borders. Probably the, the most powerful illustration of this interdependence is the fact that I'm recording this video on my computer right now. International society has been brought to its knees by an anthropogenic environmental disaster. A pandemic that has its roots in our dysfunctional relationship with nature. This terrible year of death, lockdown and losses can be attributed in part to humanity's over-exploitation of our natural world. The same activities that drive environmental destruction bring wildlife, livestock, people and pathogens into closer contact, making parts of our planet into petri dishes for disease. We know that industrial farming, the illegal wildlife trade and deforestation all multiply the chances that a calamity like this will happen and happen again. We also know that risks like zoonotic disease are just one player in a whole cast of anthropogenic environmental villains waiting in the wings. Earlier this year, the World Economic Forum reported that the top five risks to the global economy now are all environmental challenges. Greenhouse gas emissions, agricultural intensification and overfishing are all gradually stacking the odds against us. So to succeed, those global deals I mentioned will have to reach into the letter of the law and the fabric of society in very novel ways. Of course, there have been important international agreements in the past, but the ubiquity of action needed to comply with those three treaties on the table is like nothing humanity has ever accomplished before. Each of the three international conventions has close to 200 countries signed up. That's 200 nation states willing to work together to affect changes in the way we live of a completely unprecedented scale. Transformation in almost every sector of the economy, in almost every corner of the globe. And perhaps the most extraordinary thing is this. Most of the benefits that this action will be bring won't be enjoyed just by people we've never met on the other side of the globe that they'll, they'll be enjoyed by people who haven't even been born yet. This is a concept of intergenerational justice that stretches the conventional economic and social assumption that people care mostly for themselves, plenty for their immediate kin and kin, but much less for unknown people in an unknown future. This idea of equity between generations is developing as a rule of international law, building on the idea of sustainable development, first set out in the 1980s. Development which meets the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That concept might sound like common sense, but to deliver it is a radical proposition. It means overcoming short-termism in politics which has traditionally been governed by electoral cycles that last just a handful of years. Groundbreaking environmental legislation like the UK Climate Change Act of 2008 set legally binding long-term targets to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 with milestones along the way, forcing politicians to think further than the next election. And now, under pressure for environmental campaigners, our government's considering setting similar long-term, legally binding targets for air, water, waste and wildlife. We'll be legally obliged to curb our consumption today to benefit future generations. 
And these legal principles are becoming embedded in international and national law, appearing in multilateral agreements in the EU acquis, and now in national statute too. In stopping ourselves from doing harm today, we're making progress in political considerations beyond borders and between generations that could improve the way we cooperate and work together in areas far beyond climate change. And similar changes are taking place in the way we structure our money and markets and measure our success. That assumption that temporal distance between people leads to inversely inverse proportion about how much they care is embedded in conventional economic thought. In other words, current generations will value present consumption over the need to save for future generations. But modern environmental economics is starting to revise that thinking. Lord Stern's review of the economics of climate change was groundbreaking in assigning a low discount rate, reducing the weighting that economic calculations give to present value over future value. And now the work of the review of the economics of biodiversity could play the same role in revolutionising the way we think about long-term investment in nature. These approaches are also being reflected regularly on on-the-ground applications, like customers increasing willingness to pay higher energy bills or water bills today to avoid future environmental harm. And these changes are leading to further innovations that will have positive effects well beyond the environmental field. One of the best ways we have to reduce environmental harm is to structure markets better to account for their costs, internalising environmental damage in the price of products. This will have the effect of rebalancing injustices that have been taking place for hundreds of years. For far too long, Pollution has been treated as free. A chemical company that dumps effluent in a river can take its product to market and make a profit without bearing any of the costs of disposal or the harm that might be caused to people and wildlife downstream. But on the other hand, a farmer who goes above and beyond the rules to manage his farm to sequester extra carbon or provide habitat for wildlife is rarely rewarded for the extra benefits she might provide. Now though, we're getting better at structuring markets to rebalance the system. Emerging principles of polluter pays and the provider is paid are being realised in real law. Policies like agri-environment schemes that pay farmers for public benefit, but pollution taxes like the landfill levy, the plastic bag tax, carbon pricing and extended producer resp responsibility for packaging are all helping to reshape markets to reward those who provide public good and ensure, on the other hand, harm is properly accounted for. Pricing that damage into the cost of products moves the invisible hand so that markets guide consumers toward more ethical choices. They make the nature-based choice the natural choice. And the need to do that on a more systemic basis is helping to drive new ways in thinking about the way we measure our success as a society. It's been obvious for a while now that gross domestic product, GDP, is a pretty narrow way to account for how well we're doing. And Bataan famously led the world with its shift to measuring gross domestic happiness. This has since inspired well-being indices around the globe, most notably in New Zealand's well-being budget last year. And environmental thinking is helping to catalyse those changes. In traditional GDP measures, burning oil and gas, chopping down pristine forests or mining the untouched deep seabed all add to our score. In reality, of course, those apparent profits are simply borrowing from the future, storing up environmental costs. And nature is a loan shark. Borrow too much for too long and the interest rate will be repaid high in fire, floods and lost livelihoods. New measures of environmental success look instead to the value of ecosystem recovery, to the health of environmental assets and to people's equitable access to a healthy environment as a way of accounting for our natural riches. And these changes aren't just environmentally beneficial, they're socially progressive, helping to shift us away from the cold capitalism of consumerism toward a fairer model that can help ensure people thrive along with our natural world. For me, tackling environmental injustice is the mission of our generation. 
It's a scandal that even in a rich country like the UK, 40,000 people die prematurely each year from air pollution. That people's chance of access to a healthy natural environment is skewed by race and social class. That excessive consumption today could lead to a suffering for billions of people in future generations who can't speak up for themselves. Rebalancing our relationship with nature will help to rebalance these social injustices. And to do so, we'll need to develop new ways of structuring multilateral, multi-generational political agreements and new ways of organising our money and our markets. So what comes next? The brilliant BirdLife International has just launched a campaign to make a healthy natural environment a human right. I think the rights-based approach to ensuring that everyone can drink clean water, breathe pure air and live in a thriving natural environment has great promise. It also has a pleasing symmetry as innovative rights-based law that can have its roots in older ways of thinking that have even attributed rights to nature itself. But whatever happens, next year will be a turning point. Coronavirus has thoroughly put paid to Super 2020. Instead, we've had yet more reminders of why these talks are so vital. 2020 is on course to be the hottest year for the Earth's surface since reliable records began in the mid 1800s. David Attenborough brought us Extinction the Facts, a warning of the sixth mass extinction with a million of the eight million species on Earth at risk of disappearing. And coronavirus has shown us that there's a direct line of sight between the consumption choices we make here at home and the health of ecosystems and the economy around the globe. These problems are like nothing humanity has faced before. But nor has any generation stood so ready to face the challenge with the technical, economic and political innovation that's racing forward with our efforts to avert environmental disaster. The talks next year are crucial. They'll be difficult. But there can also be a springboard for improvements in our way of life that go far beyond environmental prosperity. We've missed Super 2020, so let's make it a spectacular 2021. The future of everything depends on it. <laughs>